This afternoon, 16 current and former female collegiate athletes filed a lawsuit against the NCAA, alleging sex-based discrimination over its decision to allow transgender athletes, such as former Penn swimmer Leah Thomas, to not only compete in women's sports, but give them access to women's locker rooms. They say the experience of undressing in front of Thomas and seeing Thomas fully exposed violated their right to privacy and in the process violated Title IX. Two of the plaintiffs, former All-American swimmers Reka George and Riley Gaines, join me now. So guys, thank you so much for joining me. I wanted to start with you, Reka. Um, tell me, why are you filing this lawsuit today against the NCAA? You know, there are many reasons, but I think the most important one is that this is the time to speak up for all the women in the future um, because we were not able to speak up when we were out late and just support them and be there for them and speak up for them. I think that's one of the main reasons why I being part of this lawsuit. Riley, one of the claims in the lawsuit, I'm going to read it here. It says that the NCAA has imposed a radical anti-woman agenda on college sports. Can you tell me what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, you're looking at what it looks like. Uh, both Reka and I, and certainly, certainly not limited to just Reka and I, um, have fallen basically victim to what the Biden administration, what the NCAA, what the IOC, what a lot of these large governing bodies are now doing. And that's actively and openly, and openly discriminating against women on the basis of our sex, uh, which is everything that Title IX was passed to prevent from happening. Uh, so what the NCAA did, again, to Reka and myself and continues to do to countless female athletes in a variety of sports um, is explicitly violate Title IX. Uh, the federal civil rights law that gave us the opportunity to compete and be successful at the highest level. Riley, what do you say to the argument um, that Leah Thomas had suppressed her testosterone levels? She was on hormone therapy for two years. Do you still believe that her competing is unfair? Of course I do. Um, women are not just a testosterone threshold. That is not the qualification to being a woman. Uh, even if Thomas had zero nanomoles per liter of testosterone in his body, um, there are still advantages that males possess over women that make this unfair. Uh, the bottom line is, even if this wasn't a physical sport, it's a woman's category. Uh, and by allowing men into women's category, you are, again, objectively discriminating against women on the basis of our sex. So to win an All-American title at the NCAA championships in swimming, swimmers have to post one of the top 16 fastest times in their preliminary races in their events. So, Reka, in the 500-yard freestyle, you placed 17th, um, and that's an event that Leah Thomas went, uh, went on to win in the finals. Do you believe you were cheated out of being an All-American because Leah Thomas was allowed to compete? Yes, for sure. Um, you know, like, going into the competition, everybody knows that it's going to be a tough race. Everybody's fighting for that one spot in the A or the B final. Uh, but going into a race where you know that one spot is going to be taken for sure, that's a totally different mindset. You know that there's only 15 spots left and you have to make it or you are out. And before the race, I, I, I think I was in the best physical what I have ever been. And I had the last chance, like I was a senior, I was ready for racing, I was ready for going and give, give it all. Um, so, yes, I, I feel like I was cheated out from the final because I knew that Leah is going to be in front of me for sure. And, you know, like watching that last heat of the 500 freestyle, it was just so emotional. And looking at the screen after um, the last heat touched the wall and saw my name at 17, um, I was shocked, to be honest. Um, I went through all the feelings and, you know, like I was surrounded by my teammates and my coaches and... I started crying, I broke down because I felt right away that, you know, like I don't have the second chance to swim again. And it just, it, it wasn't unfair. It, it was so unfair. When you first ran into Leah at the NCAA championships, tell me about what you noticed and what it felt like to see her at the championships. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm a short girl. I'm 5'10". But bumping into somebody who's much taller, much bigger physically, it was just scary. 
it, I was scared, I felt uncomfortable, and I had the question in myself that, am I at the right, at, am I at the right place? How did that affect your mindset? It definitely affected, um, you know, like, usually when you are going into a race, you are ready, you know what to do, but having something which is outside of your control that definitely affects you, you automatically think about it. And it was really hard not to think that I would have to race against Leo. Riley, tell me about how you found out that Leah Thomas was going to be sharing a locker room with you and the other girls. Uh, well, the first time we found out that this would be the case was when we were actually undressing next to this six foot four man who uh, was also simultaneously undressing, fully exposing himself and his male genitalia. Uh, we were not given any prior acknowledgement. We were not given a way to make other arrangements for ourselves if this was something as women, as female athletes that we felt uncomfortable with. Uh, so again, the first time we saw this was when it was actually happening. And I can't even put into words the feelings of, I mean, it's, of course it's awkward, it's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable but really the feelings of betrayal and utter violation. And on, honestly, the locker room aspect to this whole thing was traumatizing. And it, it wasn't even necessarily traumatizing because of what we were forced to see or how we as women were forcibly exploited without our consent. Um, it was traumatic for me to know just how easy it was for those, those people who created and enforced these policies totally dismiss our rights to privacy without even a second thought, without even bare minimum forewarning us. Again, I, it's it's impossible to put into words the feeling of you having your back turned. Um, again, undressing, and let's be honest here, a, a swimming locker room, it's not a place of modesty. Um, and, and I think we can all agree a locker room is not a comfortable place in general. But growing up a swimmer, you, I think, you know, at least for speaking for myself, you grow to feel comfortable being vulnerable in that environment. Um, but that vulnerability was entirely stripped from us when you have your back turned, um, you're undressing, and all of a sudden you hear a man's voice in that changing space. Um, it was inherent, it was innate for every girl in that locker room to cover themselves, uh, whether that was with their hands or their towels or their clothes, and to get out of that locker room as quickly as they could. Reka, for most of us, putting on a swimsuit doesn't take that long, but it wasn't actually until I read the lawsuit that I learned a competitive swimming race suit is much different. It's really tight. It could take 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes 30, 40 minutes to put on. Does that process make it more uncomfortable in a locker room? Definitely, yes. I mean, you know, like you expose your body to everybody who's in the locker room. Everybody can see you. And spending that much time with somebody who you don't feel comfortable with, it just makes it even worse. And you like we were forced at the NCAAs to do this, you know, like as Riley said, we didn't get a heads up. I mean, I guess I can I say lucky myself just because my coach told us the day before of the competition that yeah, they asked the question at the meet, coaches meeting and the NCAA said that Leah is gonna uh, change with you guys in the locker room. So I got a heads up, but it doesn't change a thing. It might sound st silly for some people, but we had 18 to 22 years old girls in the locker room and some of them may have not seen a naked male before. And that's just not right. Riley, the lawsuit argues that students and athletes, their speech was suppressed. They were encouraged not to speak out. They were maybe even not speaking out because they were scared of what their classmates might say, what the pressure might be like on campus. Can you describe that environment a little bit more? Um, Yes, and unfortunately I can describe it because I live it. Um, after becoming pretty public uh, after all of this and, and taking that initial stand and saying, hey, this is wrong, uh, and really putting my, my face and my name to it, um, I've subjected myself to um, an obscene amount of hatred, honestly, and vitriol and violence in many scenarios, which is exactly why Girls are terrified to speak out about this. Um, understandably so, no one wants to be labeled as transphobic or homophobic or racist or white supremacist or domestic terrorist or fascist or the list goes on of things that I can tell you that I have personally been called, all for saying uh, that there are two sexes, 
You can't change your sex. And each sex, men and women, are both deserving of safety, privacy, and equal opportunity. And for saying that again, um, it's just been met with some of the most heinous things you could possibly imagine. Um, in terms of the stifling our speech, that is something that I saw um, and I think we continue to see on college campuses especially, but not limited to just college campuses. Uh, this movement has infringed upon our First Amendment rights uh, without a doubt, and it shows how really this has transcended beyond just women's sports. But I certainly believe that's the first place that we fight back um, is to the NCAA, which is why I'm super excited for the lawsuit. Riley, a lot of people do label you as an anti-trans activist, as transphobic. How do you respond to those kinds of labels? Well, my response is if if my stance is, you know, um, makes me transphobic, then understand everyone who opposes us is simply a misogynist. Um, I My stance is not anti-anything. My stance is pro-reality. It is pro-fairness. It is pro-common sense. It is pro-woman. And if being pro-woman is deemed anti-trans, then it must mean that being pro-trans is deemed anti-woman. And what do we call someone who's anti-woman? We call them a misogynist. But I think it's important to realize uh, Reka and myself and the other athletes who are signed on to this lawsuit, um, we are standing for something. We are standing for women. Again, we are standing for women's sports. We are standing for reality. Uh, we are not standing against anything. There's certainly a place for people who identify as trans to compete in sports. Of course there is. And I encourage everyone, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation or race or what sports you might play, I encourage everyone to play sports, but play in a category that is fair and that is safe. Uh, Thomas competing against us was neither of those things. Reka, you wrote a letter to the NCAA and you hand delivered it to an NCAA official at the end of the 2022 championships. And I just want to read what you wrote in that letter, just a short snippet of it. You said, it feels like that final spot was taken away from me because of the NCAA's decision to let someone who is not a biological female compete. You never got a response for that letter that you wrote, um, but the letter was made public. It went pretty viral, especially in the swimming community. Um, and you haven't really spoken out since that letter. Can you tell me about the backlash that you received for that letter and why you've now decided to speak out now? Yeah, I mean, I you know, like when I sent that letter, I didn't know that it's going to be that big. I just spoke up about something I believe it's the right thing to do. And as we talked about earlier, we were pretty much told not to talk about it. Um, but I felt that's the right thing to do. And after I sent that letter, I just got a lot of messages, you know, good and bad. But also people threatened me. And not just me, but my family, my friends, like everybody who was important for me. And I didn't think that it's safe for me to go public and give my say, uh, face to it. And even if I wasn't public in the past two years, I was still working in the background. I helped with research. I helped with studies. Um, you know, like I, I tried to do my best without being in the front of, of everything. And I'll just add very briefly um that reka sending that letter it certainly gave me the courage to say something had reka not done that she was really the first athlete um at that national championships to take a stand had she not done that and had i not um seen that i certainly would not have taken the stand that i did so i could not be more grateful for reka and she certainly inspired and continues to inspire more people than i think even she could possibly realize Riley, for the past two years, you have been one of the most vo vocal people on this topic. And now you're joining a lawsuit with 15 other women. What's changed in that time, do you think? Uh, well, unfortunately, these circumstances continue to happen. Um, I think for a while, myself included, uh, we kind of just wanted this to be something that was a one-off and we could sweep under the rug and move on. And the NCAA would learn from this, they would see the effects and they would change their policies and we could all move on. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not the direction that the NCAA has gone. Uh, and this continues to happen again at every level. Um, and because of that, uh, people are fed up. People are rolling up their sleeves and they're saying enough is enough. People who have been impacted, people who haven't yet been impacted, but who fear that. Um, parents who have young daughters who, who want to create a better future for their daughters. Uh, 
women who fought relentlessly for Title IX 50 years ago, uh, who got to reap the benefits of Title IX. Now they understand they're having the exact same fight again 52 years later. Um, so this, this fight and who is in this fight is broad. Uh, it extends certainly beyond political affiliation, beyond party lines. Uh, and in reality, this is a unifying issue. Uh, this is an issue that majority of Americans, regardless, again, of, of how you politically align, uh, majority of Americans, set, it polls consistently at 75 plus percent, um, agree that it's wrong and harmful to women to have men in women's sports, women's locker rooms, women's prisons, um, women's sororities, the list goes on. They understand the need for sex segregated spaces where privacy, safety, and equal opportunities are threatened. Um, that's what's happened. People are finding their voices. They're becoming bolder because, again, they've either unfortunately already been impacted or they see in the near future how they could potentially be impacted. Reka, do you think that Leah Thomas should be able to compete in another way? Yeah, I think everyone deserves a way to compete. I don't know if you have ever played sports, but it's it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of effort. It's like you give up your family, you give up your friends because it just takes everything away for you if you want to be the best in your sport. And I think everybody deserves a category to compete in. It just has to be the right way. It has to be fair to everyone. So I have a question here that I want to hear from both of you. And Reka, I'll start with you. If you were in charge of the NCAA, what would you do? I would definitely change the rules to protect biological female um, and open maybe a new category for those people who who are trans female or trans male um, and just make the competition fair and safe for everybody. Riley, what about you? Um, Well, I would first by taking account, start by taking accountability and responsibility, which is something that the NCAA has not done thus far. Uh, They have not issued any sort of apology. They have not issued any sort of statement acknowledging uh, the effects that this had on women, that it continues to have, again, on the countless NCAA sports where men are competing in the women's category. Um, So first and foremost, accountability and responsibility. Um, And secondly, I would enforce Title IX's original intent. Uh, The solution is there for them. The solution has been in place the past 52 years. I think we as if I were a part of the NCAA, you keep making strides to build Title IX to ensure that there are an equal number of scholarships given at each school, which again is the original intent of Title IX. Uh, That's what I would be doing as an NCAA governing board member. Uh, There's a lot of problems, not just this issue, that women's sports, sports in general face. Uh, NIL, of course, we have seen that become um, a big issue as of recently. Uh, What about, you know, funding of facilities and resources and mental health. And and there's a slew of other issues that we could and should be spending our time talking about. But no, instead we're spending our time talking about something that's that's easy to handle. Um, It has been handled the past 50 or so years, um, which ultimately puts everyone back. Riley, what rights would you say were violated during your time as a college swimmer? Um, Well, obviously our, our promise to fair competition was violated. Um, Our promise to privacy and areas of undressing was violated. Our promises to endowed by the constitution of free speech were entirely violated. Um, At my school, we had to go to training to learn how to use she, her pronouns where they brought in an outside professional, whatever that means, uh, who sat me down as a 21 year old senior in college and, and taught me how to use pronouns. And if I didn't, If I didn't adhere to the training to their standard, I had to re-go through it. Um, Along with a slew of other ways, they they stifled our speech. Um, Our safety, maybe in in a sport like swimming, no, it's not like there's physical contact while we're competing. But in sports like volleyball or field hockey, now we've seen those girls, their safety is entirely compromised at the hands of the NCAA. Again, this is entirely preventable, which is why we're were participating um, in this lawsuit. Reka, can you speak to what you hope the lawsuit ultimately does? Yeah, I mean, you know, like the lawsuit is about all the female athletes coming together and speaking up about uh, what we believe is right and 
to change the rules to make the competition fair and square for everybody. So my biggest hope is that NCAA open its eyes and changes its rules and protects females in the future uh, and do a better job than what it has done in the past couple years.